We are moored at the Kia Raswan since yesterday evening at seven o'clock. It's now seven o'clock in the morning and I'm enjoying the scenery around us. In a few moments, we will discover one of the tourist attractions of the city, the unfinished obelisk. With a weight of 1168 tons and a length of 41.75 meters, it is the largest of all known obelisks. It is in its rough state, not detached from the rock mass, in a large quarry of pink granite or cyanite, located two kilometers south of Sienne, the former name of Aswan. The construction work was abandoned because of a large, unrepairable crack in the rock. Egypt has few granite monuments, but all the obelisks and many statues and sphinxes are made of the particular pink granite from this quarry. The unfinished obelisk dates from the New Kingdom, therefore more than 3,000 years old, and had never been cleared until the winter of 1922. This was done under the direction of Reginald Engelbach, curator of the Cairo Museum. It was he who put forward the hypothesis, considered the most likely today, of explaining how these monoliths were produced. The quarrymen struck the granite with balls of dolerite to split it or even out the surface. A thermal shock was jointly caused consisting of heating and then cooling the rock to weaken it. The obelisk was not hewn but excavated. I found another hypothesis in a video from the planet Raw channel, but I don't think it has much chance of appealing to specialists. At least it has the merit of showing us a part of the obelisk normally hidden from view of visitors. But what happened when they dug under the obelisk and there was no longer enough stone to support it? And how did they go about detaching it completely from the source rock, transporting it and then straightening it once it arrived at its destination? And when were the inscriptions engraved on its four sides? Whether the ancient Egyptians had the technology to extract, transport and erect these enormous needles is still one of the mysteries of their civilization today. Since he took power in 1954, Gamal Abdel Nasser had dreamed of erecting a dam on the Nile. Egypt already had a dam built by the English in Aswan, inaugurated in 1902. But in the 1950s, in the face of population growth, the authorities sought to increase energy resources and extend cultivatable land while avoiding floods and droughts. After the failure of the agreement signed with the United States in 1955 and the nationalization of the Suez Canal, it was finally the USSR that financed the project. On January the 9th, 1960, Nasser launched the start of the construction work. On May the 15th, 1964, the Reis and the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev witnessed the start of the filling of the High Dam. However, the project threatened priceless archaeological treasures. 24 pharaonic and Greco-Roman temples and chapels risked being engulfed in the immense artificial lake, which bears the name of Lake Nasser. UNESCO then coordinated the largest archaeological rescue in history. 
20 gigantic monuments were dismantled and rebuilt sheltered from the waters, including the famous temples of Abu Simbel. If the ancient treasures were saved, the people were condemned to exile. The lands of the ancient Nubia were largely submerged by the water and a large part of the population was forced to leave the fertile banks of the Nile for the arid countryside of the south and the big cities. For 11 years, 35,000 Egyptian workers and 3,000 Soviet engineers and technicians worked on the site. And 220 people lost their lives there. The USSR financed 40% and the rest was paid for by Egypt in cotton in the form of barter. Lake Nasser is almost 500 kilometers long and its width varies between 5 and 35 kilometers. It extends over 6,216 square kilometers, 5,250 in Egypt and just under 1,000 in Sudan. On January the 15th, 1971, three months after Nasser's death, his successor Anwar el-Sadat and the chairman of the Supreme Soviet Nikolai Podgorny inaugurated the dam. Sadat pays a vibrant tribute to the USSR for its political and economic support. Since then, the Lotus Flower Tower commemorates the friendship between the two nations. The validity of this dam has always given rise to lively debate. Its detractors accuse it in particular of having reduced the fertilizing silt downstream, forcing growers to use chemical fertilizers. It also reduced the surface of the Nile Delta, eaten away by the Mediterranean Sea. Since 2013, another dam has become a source of conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia. This is the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, built on the Blue Nile. Once this dam is completed, Lake Nasser is likely to suffer from water shortage. For Egypt, this means less production of hydroelectric energy and less water available for the irrigation of crops in the Nile Valley. The first of the 13 turbines of this new dam was commissioned on February the 20th, 2022. The visits are now over for today, so we'll take the opportunity to go around the city. On our boat, some are busy, others are walking. The neighboring boat is preparing to welcome its new passengers. For me, I will spend the rest of the afternoon watching the Valley of Felucas on the Nile.
Tomorrow we will visit Philae, the domain of Isis.